سر بر نکردی از عشق گفتم باور نکردی دل را بکندم ارزان به پایت سودای مهرش در سر نکردی بر من گذشتی سر بر نکردی از عشق گفتم باور نکردی دل را Hello friends, uh, thank you for joining us. I know that some of you will be coming in a little later, but I would like to speak and pay my respects to 
some people who have passed away today from our community. Uh, first of all, of course, is Soli Sorabji, a great man, a great friend of Parzor, a great lover of food and the good life. Zina too has COVID, the children aren't here, so it has been a pretty difficult day. Uh, we've also lost two other Parsis. So our little, tiny little community has had three funerals. Of course, none of us could attend. I think all of us need to join in the prayers on Zoom on Sunday for our country, our community, and the world itself. I think we also need to reach out and help because there are a few of us carrying and ferrying or getting carried and ferried oxygen cylinders between homes of people, young and old, who cannot access oxygen. If a lot of you all have been asking me where you should donate, please donate to Khalsa Aid. You can just go on Google. They are the only people, God bless them, who are in the field, who are giving oxygen, carrying it to cars. They've opened up the Gurdwaras, which are air-conditioned, and they've converted them into what they call oxygen langars. It's a wonderful concept, an oxygen langar, which is, I mean, as army kids, we <clears throat> grew up with langars. And here are oxygen lungers, which are keeping people alive. I'd like to keep a moment of silence in memory of the many, many millions of people who have been lost to this dreadful disease before I turn to this evening. We thought a lot about this evening, whether we should go ahead or not. And I know that everything that our community stands for is the fight against evil. It's the fight against sickness and disease. It is about positivity. And that is why just like last year, when at the worst of times where we didn't know what was happening around us, we didn't even know what COVID was, we started Friday forums. That is why we will continue the Friday forums. Though our hearts may be breaking, it is very important to keep alive the fight and to bring positivity back to this world. Thank you. And I want to thank Mohit especially because he's here with COVID right now as we speak. And I'm going to be welcoming both of them in just a minute. Let's put our heads down in prayer. Thank you, friends. I am very, very grateful to Nilofa Malvalwala, who's woken up very early in Canada to be with us today. Uh, born and raised in Karachi, she now lives in Canada, but she's traveled the whole world, carrying her love of Parsi food and other food with her. And she began her cooking, uh, experimenting with cooking at the early age of 17 when she gave her first cooking class. And Nilofer has her Nilofer's Kitchen blog, which I literally salivate at when I look at the pictures over there. She writes ebooks, she writes for the Huffington Post, and her recent book is absolutely fabulous. I know because I have it with me. Welcome, Nilofer. Thank you so much for being with us. Mohit Balachandran is a very dear friend. As I said, he's not well, and yet he's come online. And in honor of all those who are suffering from COVID, I think we need to say a big thank you to Mohit for being so brave and being with us. Uh, he's, like me, a proper army brat. And that's why he's traveled the whole of the country and realizes how rich it is in culture and cuisine. He's going to tell you a wonderful story 
about the discoveries he's made in Udwara, which we never knew anything about, though we visit Udwara quite regularly as Zoroastrians. A restauranter by profession, he is now a person who is working on the business side of things, but he knows the community very well. He has helped us so much during the everlasting flame, for that we'll be eternally grateful to him. And of course, he has created the iconic soda bottle maker Wala. So for Mohit, we have to say thank you to making Farsi and Irani cuisine known across India and now hopefully with Nilofa across the world. So Mohit believes like a good Parsi and Munnabai that juice pivano, karam ramvano, ne majha thi life karvano is most important. Thank you, Mohit. Welcome, Nilofa and Mohit. I hand it over now to you. Thank you so much, Anas. It's a pleasure and honor being here. Are we audible to everyone? Yes. Okay. It's all right. So uh, thank you all for joining here. Uh, we all share the love for Parsi food. Uh, it's, you know, it's an amazing cuisine and Parsis are an amazing community. And I've had the good fortune since I've been working on the Sora Bottle of Nawala project since 2013 to be associated with the community and to work on popularizing the food. Um, I think my, I, I, I interacted with Nilufar some uh, six, five or six months ago, and uh, she sent me her book and it's amazing what she's been doing with, with food. So I'm going to start off with uh, asking Nilufar that uh, how did you get introduced to Parsi food? Thank you for having me. Uh, well, I was brought, uh, born and brought up in a traditional Parsi home. And we ate Parsi food daily on a daily basis. And basically, I think we just took it for granted that all Parsis ate Parsi food. I was uh, particularly lucky because uh, my family were a whole load of good cooks put together. And every meal was simple, but every meal was delicious. And again, I think we just took it for granted until we grew up and tasted what uh, was not good and what was good. And we generally ate at home. So that was how I was introduced to it. And slowly as we started traveling a lot and tasting other cuisines, I kept going back to Parsi food and I was and still am at heart a Desi Baba. And for me, I cannot say that I um, prefer another cuisine over Parsi, uh, even to this day. Although I do enjoy a good Western meal, but it doesn't take over. So I had a lot of uh, uh, traditional foods growing up. We always had uh, everything proper, like dandar, patya on our birthdays. And uh, it was just very, very traditional in our home. Go ahead. So tell us, uh, uh, tell us about your books, uh, Nilifar, and your journey with Parsi food. Well, the books... Uh, my mom has always been a very meticulous uh, kind of journal keeper. And here is a book that she has handwritten. And uh, she always kept everything to the T. But if you ever ask anybody else, they always say, Thoru ai, Thoru ai nakhida. And my dad, who was a great influence in my life. Uh, sadly, I lost him when he was quite young and I was quite young. Uh, he always promoted everything Parsi. So on his 25th death anniversary, a year before that, I decided that I would put together a book 
uh, I had already had a blog. I already had that little bit of photography with me uh, through friends and family. And I started looking into doing that. Fortunately for me, uh, over Twitter uh, in 2015, uh, this uh, publisher asked me about it. And I agreed to it. And I jumped on the bandwagon and that was it. And very quickly, we put together this. Though I love it, I had no input in the book. And on the day of the book launch, I decided in my own mind, because of the challenges and the frustrations that I had with this book, uh, that I am going to put together a second book because there's so many, like there's so much to share. And this time I'm going to do it my way. So this uh, Books for Cooks was where it was, at the launch. And after that, on that day, Although I had decided, obviously, there was lots to be done. In the meantime, uh, Cordon Bleu was one of the moments in my life, which I must say I thoroughly enjoyed. And although uh, I was very, very nervous, I have to admit, uh, it was such a beautiful experience in my journey that it, some moments you treasure, and this will be one of those days or moments that I treasure. Yes. I'll, I'll interrupt you. Uh, how is it different really for in writing a book from writing a blog? Oh, very different. First of all, in the blog, uh, you just kind of uh, don't have to worry about it because whatever your thoughts are, you put, pen it down. And then if you have an error or two or whatever, or later on, if you redo the recipe, you can always chip and chop and change and it, it happens, you know? But in the book, you have to uh, read it a million times. And even then, at the end of the day, you'll find that one or two or three errors in it, which annoy you till the next print. And uh, this, ha this is the main thing about a cookbook. Although I have to say that I think that pictures make a cookbook. Obviously the re a recipe is very, very important, but the pictures make it. And uh, the second book I feel uh, is a little superior only because of the pictures that have been put in, you know? And a lot of work went into that. It's professionally done, but I learned how to do photography, which again, through my journey, I have really enjoyed and I keep feeling very blessed that I did it. And half the pictures are my teachers, William, and half the pictures are mine. So I would encourage anybody who's in food photography uh, to put together something of their best pictures. So tell us, see, first book I always believe is like your first love. So tell us more about your first book and how you got writing, what all did you cover, what so all you thought, thought you, didn't, you couldn't cover. Yeah, so it was very obvious that it had to be Dhamsak and, you know, the basic Gambarnu Papetan Ghost and uh, Rabo and whatever we eat every day. But every cookbook, I believe, should have your own personal stamp on it. <clears throat> So although most of the recipes are uh, ancient recipes, family recipes that are shared, uh, there are a couple of things which are my own. And I think that's important. The other thing is because it was a tribute to my dad, obviously there's a little bit of how we grew up, uh, what were his favorites, what were my favorites, my mom's favorites. And of course, my aunt Willie, who was my uh, mentor. Everybody in the family cooked, but even she taught and she sold uh, cakes. She didn't really focus on Parsi food. I think most of that generation uh, kind of decided that they had to do Western food. If they were the gourmet cook, they were something better. And now we are going back to our roots. So living in the West, 
when you don't have access to everything that you are used to, you have time to think about it. And suddenly there was this friend I had uh, from the Cook's Cook in America. And she's the one who said, Nilofa, it has to be Parsi food. If you promote something like that, you are teaching all of us in the food world, in the culinary world, we have never heard of it. And she used to work in New York in a very prestigious food uh, publishing place. And she never knew what Parsi food was. And that made me realize that here is a chance to share it with the world. And although it's never very simple or easy to break into an already established culinary world, it just happens. You just have to push, you just have to be passionate and that passion eventually pays off. So it was not difficult to get the recipes. It was just the idea of the journey and I am thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying it. And uh, the second book uh, somehow won its own awards uh, and I didn't have to push it as much as the first book. So I'm happy with both. Uh, yes, I will write a third one. Uh, but it will be a completely different kind of a road. So tell us more about the third one. What are you planning? Sneak. I'm planning to write something more about uh, Persia to India and what our food shares the commonalities between Persian Irani food and Indian Parsi food. And that road or the route so I think I'm going to call it the route to Parsi cooking from Pars to India. And Thanks. I want to just emphasize on the spices that are common, uh, the basic things that are common, which we use obviously every day, but we never give it a thought. So they've gone a different path. We've gone a different path, but the route and the RO2, R-O-U-T-E root is the important part of that third book. So Nilifat, tell us what is Parsi food? How do you define the cuisine? I'm going to share a paragraph from my new book, which is my favorite paragraph when somebody asks me what Parsi food is. And it's very short. So I would say Parsi cooking is really all about fresh and simple ingredients with an emphasis on healthy spices. Thus, our food predates by centuries the current food trends of organic and local eating, so fashionable in the Western culinary world today. So it's very important that we know that Parsi food is very unpretentious. It is familiar. We don't serve Parsi food in little, uh, you know, in big plates with little servings or portions. It's always served at the table. You always serve yourself. And it's a way of eating as a family. And we always had large families. So that was the way our food was served. And it's still served. So... I would call it more simple than elegant, healthy. It's reasonably healthy if you think about it. And it's really, really very affordable. And a little can go a long way. Okay. So tell us, uh, can you elaborate more about the sambar masala and the dhana jiru and other spice mixes that you think are, are important to the cuisine? Yes. So like everything in life, uh, there are different choices. And the area you come from uh, has a name for everything. It doesn't mean that it's exactly identical. It rarely is identical. So first of all, uh, for instance, garam masala. Uh, the garam masala I make has just four ingredients. 
But if you buy a garam masalo or you talk about it to somebody else, they'll have at least 10 to 15 things in it. So the idea behind my teaching is to share that many, many times, or at least nine out of 10 times, more is, uh, sorry, less is more. Don't try to put everything into everything, right? So that sort of thing, there is a controversy on Sambhar and Dhana Jiru. So in Karachi, the Dhana Jiru is a ash colored uh, uh, masala that we get from a Parsi called Setna stores. And to me, that is the best masala for Dansa. Now it may not be <clears throat> available around the world. And obviously it's different for different people. What we call the sambar is a red chili, a little oily, and I don't particularly use that, but for instance, my mother-in-law does use it. So it's just each home has its own ways of cooking. Don't ever feel that yours is wrong or mine is right. Everybody likes to cook with their flavors, with their taste buds. But whenever I teach, and whenever I share, I always emphasize that try it once and then change and chop and do whatever you want so that you know what you're changing, that you know what you're missing out on. And many, many times over and over again, people say, oh, but you have such few ingredients. Well, that is how we cook. And that is how uh, we feel that it's amazing. So I'm not going to change it. <clears throat> it's true for my akuri, it's true for my omelet. These are all very, very basic things. Oro and akuri is cooked in everybody's home. So it is what it is. And that's why I've shared it as is, how is, without trying to elaborate it or cover it up or anything like that, as are the pictures. Each of these pictures that you see are not painted, they're not touched up. They are not plastic. It is what it is. Nice. So, Nilifar, uh, since Parsi food is so dominated by meat, tell us which are the vegetarian dishes that are cooked at home and on special occasions? Now, this meat thing, like, look at this. This is all Parsi. <clears throat> and this was to prove a point, actually. But it's not true. You know, the ma gos is what we all grew up eating. And it was either equal amounts of meat and vegetable or half meat and double the amount of vegetable. And this was a way of making the family, the children, uh, the men in the house eat the vegetables. So that was how the magos came up. But it also gave flavor to the vegetables in its own way. But it was never about a plate of meat and a spoon of vegetable. It was two pieces of meat and vegetable and roti. And that is how our dinner time was. Whether we liked it or we didn't like it. The only thing that changed over the years <clears throat> for me is that I don't like to cook my vegetables to a mush. So I never overcook. So either I serve the meat separately or I add the meat towards the end or I add the vegetable to the meat towards the end is more like it. So, but generally speaking, it's a myth that it's all about meat. For instance, on a birthday, there's no meat. There's dandar and patio. There's ravo, there's sev, there's dai. There's something for idu. So actually there's no meat. The only time the meat really comes in is in dansak. And this is where I strongly believe that uh, the meat gives the flavor to the dansak. And the dansak is attached to uh, the chorum, which is the fourth day after the death. It's not attached to uh, a wedding or a naujot or a birthday. So again, there is a story behind it also, but I'm just saying that 
we are talking about meat, but we have Baman Maino, the entire 30 days can go without meat. So we have lots and lots of lots of delicious vegetable dishes, which you need to just cook right. And you won't feel, I am 100% sure that people here are not going to agree with me, but you will not miss the meat as much as you think you will miss it. And now we are even heading towards veganism and vegetarianism in a bigger way in the West. And our food can actually be perfect for vegans as well, for most part of it. And this book has at least 90% of pages that can work with vegetarians. There's only one meat and uh, chicken section, but of course that too can be sort of removed from it. So whenever I teach also, wherever there is a chance, I'll say, if you are vegetarian, you can put this substitute or that substitute and it works, it works. So tell us a few of the classic vegetarian dishes in the cuisine. Uh, well, the, the one that stands out the most is Lagan no stew. I mean, it has a, a millage of beautiful vegetables. Uh, mostly root vegetables because it has to hold. Again, it shouldn't be a mash. And then the katu mitu tikku, which is kind of very, very Farsi, okay. is ha has to be in it to finish it off. So that is the main thing. And then, of course, everything per idu is vegetarian. So right. we have tamata pa idu and bida pa idu and papeta pa idu and turiya pa idu and tamata pa idu. So that's another way of kind of serving the vegetable which is hidden under the egg which is the parsi favorite so your egg is your protein and the vegetable is there and it's a nice wholesome meal so we have a question from heta pandit who's asking that are we the only community that insists on eating jam with eggs would you like to elaborate on that Nilifar? and probably other quirky combinations that you have or you've seen uh, growing up, we had uh, a lot of contact with non-Parsis because my father had a lot, a huge circle of non-Parsi friends abroad and at home. And I still remember our house guests always commenting that we used to eat jam, like you're supposed to eat uh, toast, butter and jam, but we would eat toast, butter, jam, cheese and the egg. And it was always sort of... Uh, uh, ask the question always popped up and it's just something that we like we like a little bit of sweet with our food and that is where it comes in I think it's that katu tikku mitu uh, that keeps going on and on and on because in an akuri you don't put anything sweet so the tikku is there and then we eat the mitu with it. And I, I don't know, we've just grown up even having a fried egg with jam. And weirdly, there's a jam that is in my uh, book, which is a tomato jam, but with uh, ginger in it. So the ginger brings the little bit of spice in it. And it goes absolutely beautifully with poro and with akuri. You all should try it. But it is something that we love to eat. We have murambo or abakalyu with our dansak. And that's again the same thing. It is basically a jam, if you can call it whatever we like. But so it's just one of those things that sort of has gone on and on. And I don't see it falling off the uh, thing anytime soon because people like it. They seem to enjoy it. And so yeah, I, I'll share, you know, once I saw someone having a berry pulao with uh, lagannu custard mixed it and enjoyed it. <laughs> I didn't enjoy seeing him eat it, but uh, to each his own. Uh, another combination I have seen, uh, which I thought was very unique, was a naan khatai paridu. Naan khatai paridu? Yeah, that's... I wouldn't mind trying that, yeah. but I don't think I want to Me, have lagannu no custard with across. berry palau. <laughs> okay. So, Farooq Tijina has a question. Your lagannu stew, Nirufar, has brinjal. The traditionalist would balk at that. Do you want to answer that? Uh, what is the second part? It has brinjals and then what? A traditionalist 
a traditionalist would balk at that oh um you know the the lagano stew is traditionally made out of harder vegetables for sure it's root vegetables uh, but now that we are in the west we didn't really uh, give it that much thought and everything uh, moves with time because of what the local area people have so i know for a fact that here people just buy a bag of frozen uh, vegetables which we get i don't particularly like doing that but i did do it once or twice and it has corn in it so nobody sits and takes the corn out and they all put it into their parsi stew so in canada wherever you go you'll have a parsi stew with corn in it even the best of the uh, caterers even the best of the people who sell food their parsi stew will always have the corn not because they put it in purpose but it's in that bag and nobody bothers to remove it and somehow everybody uses that bag in the same way sometimes we'll have parsnips uh, sitting in the drawer and parsnips like carrots they keep their shape they are sweet they are delicious so i've put parsnips in it also so people don't give it that thought in the west that people have traditionalists in india because they get that uh, you know the same thing all the time here people are not that pushed about it and maybe eggplant is not put in by anyone else but i had never really given it a thought i have to admit but i'm very very fond of eggplant i put it in the oven and it works so that's why it's got it in my recipe yeah so your books are more for a global audience right because you are in the west and so you can cook that food with ingredients that are available to you so so my books were honestly published with the thought of promoting it to the next generation because when i came here i realized that the generation who were just married newly married having kids they were the generation who did not even know what a khatai was they did not know what khichdi was and it used to upset me we call them the pizza pasta generation because their parents were giving them pizza pasta while growing up even though they were eating parsi food and suddenly now in their 40s they are thinking why have we missed out on all this and every thank you letter that i have received is from one of these uh, this generation and i just feel very very happy that now we know that the food in the west the parsi cuisine in the west will carry on there is no doubt in my mind that people will eat it will try it will share it and remember in the west many children are married to non parsis and the amazing thing is that the spouse who is the non parsi is more interested in knowing about this cuisine in trying it out in testing it in tasting it and this is how authentic parsi food will carry on and without pictures it won't have worked because if you don't know what you are going to eat you are not going to make it sarwar irani has a question nilufar he is asking uh, if banana leaves are not available for patrani machhi how do you steam the dish yes fortunately for us we get everything in canada we get it from china from thailand and in fact banana leaves are very very cheap and there are actually parsis here who have grown their own banana leaves and they do grow surprisingly but in summer months they do grow and they freeze very well but if we don't have it because everybody doesn't have the access then i would say that you take a baking tray you put a foil and then you put a parchment paper on it and then with the parchment paper you put the fish on it you put your chutney on it you put another parchment paper on it and then you put it into the oven and the moisture will be there the flavor will be there i agree the banana leaf does impart a slight 
beautiful flavor to the patrani machhi which will be missing but you will still get a fairly decent patrani machhi without the patra what about butter paper butter paper also works yeah right? butter paper is the same yeah <coughs> butter paper is patra okay so tell us about uh, some sweets that you made dessert uh, particular interest of mine you know i have a sweet tooth so yeah well most parsis have a sweet tooth my dear we grew up eating caramel custard every single day and i'm not exaggerating because that was what my father needed last thing at night whether he ate outside or inside wherever he dined he had to have his one spoon of caramel custard and that is how his parents had brought him up as well so that is why it's in the book as well it's not parsi at all but it's become sort of trendy all parsis eat it it's not a parsi per se but mali do uh, darni pori uh, they say rava two types of ravas uh, we have one with egg one eggless and then of course we have all these beautiful uh, khatais and uh, mavanu cake and if you noticed we have such an ancient cuisine that there is no mention of chocolate anywhere so chocolate itself coco itself is quite ancient but it was in south america and other parts of the world and it hadn't reached this side of the world and that's why we don't have any chocolate and it's very very exciting when you find these things out because honestly parsis absolutely adore their chocolate and they are probably devastated that we don't have a chocolate dessert to call our own but we don't so it's all mostly milk sugar um and i would say cardamom rose water uh semolina uh, this is what makes our desserts so farooq has another question that you mentioned in your book you ate caramel custard with roti tell us more about that yeah so actually uh, it's delicious i i really urge everyone to try it so how it works is that we used to have our dinner very simple something ma goes whatever with roti every night was something like that and then the caramel custard so whatever part of the roti was left we were never allowed to waste anything so whatever part of the roti was left we used to eat it with the caramel custard and that's how we kind of uh enjoyed it because it becomes a habit and then it becomes a taste and my uh father also used to squeeze a little bit of lemon on it sometimes just for the fun and that also tastes really good but we grew up even in the morning sometimes if there was a rotli lying around and the pudding was in the fridge we would still eat it like instead of having bread and butter we would have the rotli and the caramel custard so that was just how not just me uh, my aunts my uncles everybody so that was possibly the way they used to eat it in their home as well mainaz irani asks any authentic persian dishes in your books a uh, berry palav is there and uh, i want to say that uh, while mawa cake is not authentic indian i mean uh, persian it's probably a mix of the well the iranis brought it to india and then they started making it but that's the little closest to the persian food but other than that not really it's just the very palau that is in this but uh, you can find a few things on my blog very easily because i have uh, this interest in irani food persian food came much later i didn't really grow up grew uh, you know eating it but this very palau is something that my mom used to make and that's why i knew about it i had an authentic recipe that she used to use so i put it in can i just interrupt if you all don't mind because i think uh, all of us also want to know what made mohit drive in 
on his mobike in pouring rain to eat something very special at Udwara. And uh, Nilofa, you need to come with Mohit and uh, eat the fish which has been cooked underground in Matti at Udwara, in the mud at Udwara. So Mohit, can you, just, can you just share a little bit about your journey with Parsi food, please? Thank you. Thank you, Shanaz. So um, I, I set up this brand of restaurant called Soda Bottle of Navala, Bombay Rani Cafe. We started in, in Gurgaon in 2013 and um, it was a fantastic journey. Uh, I no longer work with the Olive Group. That's the name of the company. Uh, so in 2015, we, uh, me and the chefs of Soda Bottle of Navala, we decided to take a trip to Udwada to you know, go to uh, the birthplace of, of Parsi, the cuisine, and you know where the center is, uh, to understand where the cuisine came from. One sees different parts of it across India. I've had the good fortune of eating the food um, in, in Bombay, in Hyderabad, in homes in uh, Delhi, uh, Pune. So, you know, the, the cuisine evolves differently in different places, though there are rules that come, you know, uh, keep it together and, and keep it Parsi. So Udwada was a fantastic experience. Uh, it was my first bike ride uh, in the rain. So it was around four hours between uh, Bombay and Udwada. And in the rain, it was fantastic. I mean, I've, I had a raincoat and it was just amazing. And in between, we stopped at Ahura. It's, it's a dhaba on the way to Udwada. And uh, it was uh, lovely food. Then in Udwada, th there are, you know, this lovely Irani bakery uh, where I had a really nice mava cake. There's also a Hormuz bakery in front of the temple. Uh, there's also a Globe Hotel, which, which, you know, has good food. And Ashish Wang, if I remember correctly, I, I, I'm sure they're still there. They've been around for many years. Uh, though the lockdown has impacted a lot of, especially f &B, the, the restaurant industry. And, uh, but my favorite was Cafe Farovar at the Soda Waterwala Dharamsala. It was run by uh, a mother-son duo. The son uh, worked as a chef in Bombay, then went back to Udwada and opened the restaurant along with his mom. And the food was, was really, really nice. It was the first time I remember having the boy fish that is popular in, in that side of town. And uh, also I, I had a prawn tatrelo there and it was really nice. Uh, this was also the first time I had uh, you know, the, the gauti cha. So, you know, I've always had it with lemongrass and mint, but uh, in Udwada, I really understood what is gauti cha and how it was used, that the local wild le lemongrass that is used there. So that's where, you know, it, it was quite an eye-opener and for all of us to understand the food and, you know, how it's evolved. So it was a one, wonderful journey. And on, on my way back, uh, there's this uh, restaurant called Parsida Daba. That's where we stopped and, and had lunch. So that's on the way back. So wonderful and Udwada's. So, you know, it, though I, it's now getting modernized, but it's, it's like a heritage village. It's beautiful. I just so fell in love with it. And uh, also about Soda Bottle of Navala, you know, we tried to create a, a Bombay Rani cafe. It's, you, know, you know, Rome has its own cafe culture. Paris has its own cafe culture. Uh, New York has its own cafe culture. This was Bombay's own cafe culture and led by the Iranis. Um, it was, you know, they ne never really had any food per se or main courses, more like Kima and Idu. And, you know, you would have, some have evolved into restaurants like, uh, but most of them would be, you know, hangout spaces where you would go hang, meet friends, have your first date. It was cheap places, but they, you know, not just affordable. They were very friendly, and uh, it's been a wonderful journey with with Parsi food and with Parsis. So, Dilfer, we have another question uh, from Homai. She says that her mom used to make a sweet dish with rotli called gungru. Sorry, called what? 
घुंगरू I think it she, she means ghungra I remember in Ahmedabad a ghungra uh homai if you could clarify because ghungra is something which you put uh, coconut if i'm not mistaken sweet coconut and you fry it am i right yeah, they are balls they are balls and i've never actually tried it but a friend of mine on facebook there was a discussion about it and he said he had eaten it in uh, Bombay at his aunt's house many years ago, but I have never seen it nor tried it. Parop thinks she means gungri. Now I know it is gungra. Now God knows what it really is. But anyway, that's one more recipe for both you and Mohit to discover. Okay, <laughs> sure. But if I remember, it it uh, is we are talking about something like a. Uh, not like a meat ball but like a ball which is deep fried yeah yeah that's i right. remember asking my willifui about it and she said all these things were made out of leftovers when you had leftovers in the house parsis never wasted food that's it right doesn't matter whether you were rich or poor it was just a no no so you can't bring a little bit of this and a little bit of that to the table so these things were created to look like something new that you put on the table the next day okay homai says it is made out of rotli not fried so homai you'll have to give us a demonstration <laughs> one day when we have some more and, <laughs> okay yeah. some and the recipe yeah and the recipe sadra yes do you do you either of you know anything about sadra i've heard of it i don't remember having eaten it yes it's a white uh, well my father used to like it but i always used to find it very kind of tasteless we used to call it sadna and not sadra and we used to get it in karachi uh, where we had a shalimar cafe and this was run uh like your rti and now of course it's all uh, gone uh and i remember it being like a steamed white rice cake if you like yeah yeah and, yeah uh, i i'm not very sure why he liked it but then after later on in the later years uh when we we used to come to bombay every year and dad used to order it from the rti my willi fu used to order it for him but yeah. i don't really know how it's made but definitely it is there uh so again somebody is asked about popadji uh i remember eating it as a kid there's a very interesting story that popadji is actually from the same a dish which you make profit rolls and we got it from the dutch and if cyrus um Uh, of dotiwala of uh, surat is online he can tell us about the dishes that they have discovered uh, based on the dutch recipes which were in their family actually this discussion has to go on and we really need to get all of our ideas in because you are right we are the last generation who's actually made all this eaten this and uh, uh, farooq has got to be on line also because he seems to know everything uh, he's got white slightly sour with charoli on top fat and round about sadhana sadhra sa whatever that was yes. so so this is go and sanna now that's a new one mohit now you take over i'm getting out this is too confusing for me <laughs> Yeah, the sannas is like an idli. It's the Goan Mangalorean version of it. So even again, we were talking about ingredients changing from area to area. Growing up in Karachi, I do not remember ever eating charoli. I didn't know what charoli was till I came to Canada. and because the indian stores here have every single thing and uh, i started trying it and then i learned about it and it has it is in many of the gujarati books so obviously it's something that is very commonly used in india 
And although we had Samna in Karachi, I don't remember ever seeing the Charoli on it, you know? So those sort of things are so important and so interesting that we switch and change and chip and chop a little bit, but we try to keep the basic flavor of it. And that is very, very important. Very, very important. Sure. So thank you so much, Nilifar. If there are no more questions, then... Uh... Uh, some more questions. Can I just jump in? Uh, what do you use in replacement of toddy and bhakra? Yes. So toddy is basically something that is fermented. So instead of doing that, you can put a little bit of yogurt outside, leave it outside, depending again on which country you are in, how hot it is. So that becomes sour. And that helps to do what the toddy did. Obviously, I haven't tasted toddy, but my mom has always uh, missed it. You know, like she also uh, had a lot of uh, toddy and everything growing up, going to India, spending time there. So we never used to get it in Pakistan. So we've always used the yogurt that has been left overnight and soured or old yogurt, if you want to use it from the fridge. And that really, really helps. It's in kumas also, bakra and kumas. Both the things have it. Okay, uh, there has been a little bit of an issue. Mohit, uh, please don't worry. I'll take over. Okay, uh, you can log off. Thank you so much. We're really grateful. And when you're feeling better, we'll have you on again. Okay, to talk more about your soda journey. So just just switch your switch your uh, video off and you can please leave and sure. stay well. Okay, God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mohit. Thank you, Mohit. Thank you so much for being on with us. Uh, I have one question. Uh, okay, somebody has said Charoli is called Chironji yes. in Hindi, but yes. uh, Parvez Bhot needs to know what it is in English. I really wouldn't know. Uh, no, so they don't. It's a it's a wild almond, very, very tiny. And I know it's also called something like Chattupata, Chadupuda or something like that, but you should Google it and it will come up. Charoli in English or whatever, it will come up. But every Indian store has it. And it is very, very cheap. So compared to almonds, and almonds in India were always a difficult thing to get and very expensive, yes. especially up till the 1980s. Uh, I remember everybody taking lots of dry fruit, especially almonds uh, from Karachi. And uh, it was very uh, difficult to get. So this uh, charoli was the kind of the main crunch or the main substitute for almonds. And I think they're pretty decent. I like I like it. Uh, Heta says it's called Kudappa almonds. So I think yeah, we've it's got a wild a, almond. you can write you can write a book on all the comments that are coming in. <laughs> but I must ask you one question, which we were discussing during our program preparation. Why is it that Parsis don't have barbecues in their traditional food when everybody else across Central Asia has so much? that yes. you put in a tandoor and things like that? Well, I my only reasoning, like I haven't done that much research except that I did always notice these things, is uh, because the fire, like smoking, uh, is sort of a no-no. So we are just going to respect our fire. And that is the only thing that comes to mind. Uh, not necessary. Uh, that I'm right about it, but I think uh, that is. But we did we did cook things underground. Yeah, that's what that's what uh, Farouk has said. Of course, we have yeah. barbecues, underground barbecues. We have yeah, slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe it was just something that never took place at that time, and like chocolate. I mean, there was nothing against chocolate. It just yeah. wasn't available to you. Or vanilla. There was no vanilla. We started adding vanilla. We only used rose. So that kind of thing was there. Like in the Middle East, they only use orange blossom. Yes. So uh, there was, you know, things evolved. 
And while we like to say that we are traditional, while we like to be traditional, there's a little fine line between taste buds and traditional. So if I don't put vanilla, insist, it's insisting that, oh, but in 1857, when they wrote this book, there wasn't vanilla. That's fine, you know, but I mean, that's up to yourselves. Like we don't even have Malay. Malay was made out of the milk we always use. It was a, a given that it was whole milk. It was yeah. never skim milk. Yeah. Like even now, people will say, oh, but I made it with 0%. It didn't happen. It's not going to happen. It doesn't have fat. Yeah. And we always had grandmothers who made uh, white butter, which is the tastiest butter, I believe, out of good full fat milk. Uh, That's it. There are two questions here or two comments. And then I have to ask you one question, which is in my mind for a long time. Uh, Sarwar wants to know, Dhansak rice needs sugar for browning. For a diabetic, what do you suggest instead of sugar for brown rice? Onion. Just brown the onion, like dark brown. And when it's not burnt, but really dark, put a little water, it will caramelize immediately. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you how much you have learned from Vividwani, because that is supposed to be the Mrs. Beaton of the Parsi world. Yes, oh, yes, yes. About... That's a very interesting thing. So I'm sadly uh, going to admit that I can't read Gujarati very well, uh, or actually I would say 1% rather than 100%. And uh, the thing is that I did refer to it through an aunt of mine. I would make her sit there and, you know, the book is falling apart and whatever. But although it is the first recorded journal and the storyline behind it is absolutely brilliant because this lady was just writing a, her journal. Yeah. And because she died, the, her doctor, who was her friend, has had this printed with his money to kind of uh, give solace to her, to her grieving mother. And that's why it's like, there's no space even between it. But what I do notice is that she's a home cook. She's not some gourmet magazine person, right? So she's writing things like, uh, supposing it's Dansak, so she'll say, I be vapra, I be, but part two of the dansak is chicken, no dansak. And then part three is vegetarian dansak. And part four is the only thing that I do know that I have taken from it is before I read her dansak book or, or her recipe, I used to always stand ground that there is nothing like chicken, no dansak, rubbish. It's not a dansak call, it's something else. And I used to really get annoyed about it. It literally, went, especially when I was young, and we only ate chicken no dansak when we came to the West. Nobody in Karachi would dare serve you a chicken no dansak and get away with it. But having read this in Vivid Vani, I have backed off because people must have eaten it at that time and there was something like chicken dansak. So it just proves that it's absolutely amazing to go back in time and read, although half of the recipes you can't make, eight kipri eye and one dabai eye and one batli eye, you can't cook like that anymore. But the essence of it is still there. The line of ingredients are still there. And I, I admire that. I think, I'm, and she was very young when she died. She, she, she died, was only 30. She was in, she died in the first 30. plague, I think. She died yeah, in the yes, first plague, yes, the Spanish yes, plague. Yes, yes. Uh, I think what you need to do and what all of us need to do here is at least photograph the recipe books in Gujarati or in whichever language we have them and uh, pass them on to Nilofer and other people so that we can uh, at least put this all uh, on record and then try out some of the recipes. So uh, I think in Vividwani also there's some very, very interesting Western uh, recipes sort of adapted to Indian circumstances like uh, 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 pastry baskets with a white sauce, which is also... Yes, that's absolutely. A, yeah, so that's that is where our fish baskets come out from. That, that is exactly what our fish baskets uh, are. So remember Parsi's 
were the uh, were always very intrigued by the British, and also we always had the advantage because we spoke English. We could dress like them, eat like them, drink like them, whiskey with them. You know all of those things. So we had all our customs and all are from them. You know it is a sort of an adaptation, and and the caramel custard is part of that. Kind of thing, right? So, is is our lagannu custard also part of that, or is it original? Uh, no. Uh, so it is part of that because it's a custard, but and very very similar, but obviously made to our taste because of the addition of the uh, badam pasta in it and the cardamom to it. That's very you know us. Very Iranian, in fact. Very yeah. Iranian. So we've got this beautiful blend of both that we have in everything. We everything, have in our life. Everything. everything. Yeah, yeah. I have to and ask you one it. question for your next book. We, uh, you know, uh, we've always grown up believing Buddhina Bal. If you know what I mean, I really don't know what it's really called. Uh, uh, the whole the whole idea of Buddhina Bal is Sutarfani. Is yes. uh, is supposed? It was supposed to be a very Parsi, Gujarati Parsi dish, but in Iran they also have a version of it. So did Sutarfani come to India with the Parsi, with the Zoroastrians, or how how did that come into being? Well, I asked a young Iranian friend of mine, and he said that it is only in one part of Iran. Like it was very much in. I I'm not hundred percent what he said, but something northeast or north north yeah, part I of it. Yes, yeah, yeah, and and, uh, and he said it was similar but not same. And uh, it is apre buddhi nabal. I think we say it because it's white. Yeah, yeah, and it looks right. like a hair. Yeah, and this is a very uh, again the original sutarfani had rose yes. and a little bit of cardamom. And a little bit of pistachio on top. Even that's Nam right. no pistachio just for the. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And uh, of course, sugar. So it's yes. like, uh, yeah. you know, sugar, whatever. But it's, it's very, very uh, delicious when it was fresh. But I think sutar funny. The word sutar sutar funny itself. Very Gujarati. Is it sutar is a Gujarati word or is it a Persian word? I think it's I think it's from India more than from Persia. Okay, but there we've is got a, we've got we've got some very interesting things. Actually, you'll have wool. to get all your yeah. yeah. You've got, you've so got uh, wool. Okay. You Firoza Hataria says they have in the South Indian weddings have a version. It's called Pashmak in Iran. Sutar means wool in Gujarati. So I think you've got to really look at all these things <laughs> and, and uh, 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 do it. I I'd like you to please tell the audience today, Nilofar, about your wonderful attempt to reach out to people and have cooking sessions for young people to learn. And have people, other people, actually support them in this. Would you like to talk about it, please? Because Parzo sure. can be supporting one person to attend your classes. Thank you. So what happens is that uh, people come out of curiosity. In the last year, because of COVID, we started this Zoom thing, and we've had over two hundred uh, classes. And in some of them, especially the bhakras. And all the traditional things that people, even if they know how to make it, were interested because it was free and there's something to learn for people who are interested. And uh, classes for Dani Pori had actually 250 people attending it. So there is an interest. Uh, so this year, when I started working again and earning out of it again, uh, because this is the only thing I do, I don't have another full time job. Uh, I decided that I wanted to reach out to people who would like to make this into a little small side business. And uh, because also about seven people came back to me after last year saying, thank you for the inspiration. We knew how to cook, but we needed the confidence. We wanted to make sure that it came out well and Somewhere down the line, we got inspired and I started selling A, B or C and it's a small business from home and it helps me. 
So I wanted to reach out to people wherever in the world. And I have now, we start next Wednesday. We've got four classes lined up. And each uh, turn, I will make three things. I tried to put one achar chutney into it because remember, those things sell the best. And they are the things that people don't make at home. Why don't they make at home? It's very hard to make a little bowl of chutney. But you have to make a whole tapela of chutney and then you have four of you and what are we going to do with it? So those are the things that people like to buy one bottle of and keep. So I've tried to add that. I've also tried to keep mava cake and stuff like that, which people can sell. And we've got simple things like vidama ghost or palau or whatever, right? So it keeps an interest going for everyone. So today I have two people from the UK uh, uh, who signed up. Uh, one from Florida, two from Texas, one from Canada, uh, three from India, and uh, I think one from Pakistan. So at least we have a nice spread out thing. Uh, the other thing is Facebook has helped promote it. And Fazana and other places where I give uh, share talks with them, very often we give away a prize. And I'm always looking for that one non-Parsi hoping that they will win. And that has happened uh, over the period of time, not out of cheating, but just genuinely they got it. So, you know, people who come from America will talk about it uh, and they'll speak about it and they'll get interested in it. And every time there's an organic hit to me, for instance, yesterday, there's a magazine somewhere in Kent called Consomme. And she approached me that the more I'm trying to read, the more I'm getting confused. Is Persian and Parsi the same thing? And can you yeah, help me? Yeah, yeah. And when I kind of explained to her and I gave her the links and I've sent her a book today, she wants to do a write-up on the book, which is fantastic because this is what the whole effort is about. Yes, it is to keep it going for our next generation. But it is also an effort that other people actually know what we are talking about. So there are two questions for that. And then a very important question before we have to wind up. Uh, do you have a WhatsApp group? Uh, how does one enroll for your Zoom classes? And how do you please share information as to how we can register? Uh, I'd like to say that we would like to promote one young uh, Zatushti from anywhere in India uh, to we will pay the fees because that is our uh, uh, thanks to saying thank you to, uh, uh, to Nilufar who's refused to take anything from us and she's always been very helpful and Nilufar we are going to have you back so anybody who would really like to and need a helping hand to, to join these classes, please approach us. Uh, the one last question, Nilofa, um, and you've got to come back here and make that lovely uh, souffle, come mirang, something which I saw on your cake, face. The cake you yes. want. Yes, oh, sure, yes. Sure. yes, not sure. that my weight should allow it. But there's a big, <laughs> there's a big question, which is about... Uh, which everyone wants me to ask you because I'm getting messages on my WhatsApp. Sorry, I came in late. This is from Mernor Shapurji, who, by the way, himself was a architect who has become a chef. Am I right? Is that the same, Mernor? Yes. What's your take on using ready-made dansak masala versus how we traditionally cook dansak at home as kids? Would you say it doesn't matter as long as it tastes good? I think this is my um, Mernosh. I think I'm right. Yes. So Dansak Masala is a combination of many, many masalas put together. And uh, to be fair, because I've always used this Setnana Masalo, which I believe is you all uh, in India, you get, uh, there are two companies that make it. One is Mangal and one is uh, abbreviation. I think it's MHD or MDH or something like that. And they make a dansak masala. Biku auntie, Biku auntie used to make her own masala. And Delhi of course. Parsi, yeah, Delhi Parsi has grown up with that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, That's another so okay. nobody will make, uh, it's, it's a long drawn process, right? 
So, yes, you do need that masala. Whether you make it yourself or you buy it, that masala is very important to dansak. And the, the, the cus or the broth or the stock of the meat with the bones is also very important. And, of course, the dal. So now people have moved away from oily tuar dal to plain tuar dal to red masoor dal. So red masoor dal doesn't have the flavor that the tuar dal has. So even if you want to make it lighter, you can use half and half, but please don't move away completely from the tuar dal because dansa is all about the dal. Yes, it's about the masala, but it's a very, very important thing to uh, kind of have the dal. So that's one part of it. You don't have to, uh, again, uh, sort of worry about whether the dansak masala is correct or not. It will be correct if it's called dansak masala and you take it from a reputable person. So there are people like, I think there's a lady called uh, Sabawala who's in India sending masalas to Canada and America. <laughs> he has she has put uh, a dansak masala. And I have been telling my friend, Naomi Mobit of Le Bon Mago, she does pickles, that come on, come up with this dansak masala for the West. It is so important. Although I have also approached uh, Setna stores, uh, because, you know, this might be the last generation. After that, what happens? Okay, we've got a Shelly Sabawala and Zari. Yeah, That's yeah. In Delhi. So, yeah. So, yes. so she it. she sends it out. Okay, okay. Uh, she sends it out. Zareen Secrets, her grandmother's recipes. Okay. Yes. Uh, we need you to quickly type in your contact for the Zoom classes, please. And okay. The other one is uh, Nilufa said it's Tur Dal in Hindi. Okay, what is Tuarni Dal in Hindi? Tour only, tour. No, no, tour no, is, tour. No? no. So split pigeon chair, Pante, I, that's in English, but tour or chair? Arar dal. Arar. Maybe, yes. Yeah, it's arar yeah. dal, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Heta. Thank you. Okay, will you I mean, please type in? Yeah, your, it's nilifa.mavilwala at gmail.com. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, I'm just do that. Yeah, arar. Thank you, Heta. I think Parsis can talk about food after eating a full wedding uh, dinner and then they'll be Absolutely. again and they'll start uh, talking about food and recipes. So we're going to have <laughs> you back and you're going to do Thank that special you. cake recipe for all of us. So, yes. uh, but any case, we'll be very happy to share details. And do you have a WhatsApp group? Somebody is asking. Or do no, you I don't have a WhatsApp group because... Uh, it's on Facebook, like we, I from, uh, put down the actual menu and everything of that week uh, on my Nilifa's Kitchen on Facebook. Okay, it's okay, on, just type uh, that on... in, please. Could you type, okay. type that in, please? Yeah. Thank you. That's on Facebook. Also on Parsi's Exchange Recipes and sometimes on Worldwide Zoroastrian as, as well. Okay. But Thank you are welcome to connect with me at any time, any point. No problem. Okay, Nilofa. Thank you so much. It's been a Not lovely session. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. And uh, now you know where you can get the masalas from. I'll give, give Shelly a call. I hope she's here today. Shelly Sabawala, Zareen Secrets, Dansak Masala. Yes. Correct. So you can get that instead of Setna stores. Okay, thank you. So, Everybody is saying thank you for a yummy session. Now we're all hungry. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Nilofa. We've really woken you up early, but we're very grateful. Um, anytime, so anytime. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to baking the cake with everyone. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bye. please stay Bye. safe. Everybody stay